Well, let us turn again to our studies in Second Samuel, Second Samuel chapter nine. Mephibosheth. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame on his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. Then king David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth. And he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show the kindness of for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I? And the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, I have given to your master's son all that belonged to Saul and to all his house. You therefore and your sons and your servants shall work the land for him, and you shall bring in the harvest that your master's son may have food to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread at my table always. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king has commanded his servants, so will your servant do. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And all who dwelt in the house of Ziba were servants of Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table, and he was lame in both his feet. We first encounter Mephibosheth in 2 Samuel 4, verse 4. Jonathan Saul's son had a son who was lame in his feet. He was five years old when the news came about when the news about Saul and Jonathan came from Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened that she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. This poor boy became an invalid on the same day as Israel was defeated by the Philistines and Mount Gilboa. That was the occasion when his grandfather Saul, father Jonathan, and two uncles were all killed. But before the day was over, this young boy also suffered a terrible accident which left him crippled for life. When his nurse heard the news that the battle was going against Israel, she fled and took little Mephibosheth with her. He was only five years old at the time, so she carried him. However, it seems that in her haste she dropped him with the result that he became a cripple. He would probably have remembered the occasion vividly. I was five years old when I started school and I can still remember my first day like it was yesterday. So doubtless Mephibosheth also remembered the events of this particular day. Everything changed for him on this occasion because not only was his family dynasty, that of Saul, effectively shorn of his power on this day, Mephibosheth was also marred for life at the same time. And I'm sure over the years he must have frequently asked himself the question, why, why, why did this have to happen to me? By the end of this narrative he knew at least part of the answer to that question. Now our text takes the story some 15 to 20 years, takes up the story some 15 to 20 years later. And Mephibosheth is now a father at this point. He had a son whose name is mentioned in verse 12. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. And of course that event must have brought considerable joy into this man's life. But apart from that, I can't imagine that he had much, much to rejoice in. That's because he was essentially living the life of a fugitive. Verse 4 tells us that he was now living on the far side of the Jordan. He is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, in Lodabar. And it's easy to understand why. It was in his own interest to keep out of the way and to stay away as far as Jerusalem from possible. 
as possible, because remember that everyone else in Saul's family who had tried to continue the dynasty was now dead. Ishbosheth had been murdered by Abner, and Abner had been murdered by Joab. So Mephibosheth was now the only member of Saul's family left who had any claim to the throne. And doubtless Mephibosheth knew these things because they were national events. And he must have sometimes asked the question, am I next? So this man's plight was a very unenviable one. Yet David showed remarkable kindness to him. He took him into his family. He granted him a place at the king's table, something that was absolutely unheard of in those days. And the story before us described one of the most remarkable acts of kindness shown towards a fellow human being anywhere in Scripture. But of course, there's much more to this incident than that. That's because David is also a type of Christ. And God ordained that his kingship should foreshadow that of the King of kings and Lord of lords, even Jesus Christ our Saviour. So while this passage has much to teach us about human love on a horizontal level, it also finds its ultimate fulfillment in the vertical love that God has for his people. There are three things I want to consider from the passage. First of all, we're going to consider David's kind question. David's kind question. Verses 1 to 4. Now David said, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, At your service. Then the king said to him, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul, to whom I may show the kindness of God? And Ziba said to the king, There is still a son of Jonathan who is lame in his feet. So the king said to him, Where is he? And Ziba said to the king, Indeed, he is in the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, and lo, Debar. Notice three things about this kind question. First of all, David asked this question about a member of Saul's house. Is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul? We must remember that David could have viewed Mephibosheth as his enemy, because as I've already hinted, he was the sole remaining heir from Saul's house, and therefore was still had a claim to the throne. Now, in those days, that's how most kings thought. Most kings would have followed the policy of a new broom sweeps clean. When they came to power, what did they do? They disposed of all possible competition by exterminating males, the males of the former ruler's household. And there are many examples in Scripture of that. For biblical examples, think of Abimelech, the son of Gideon. What did he do? He slew all his 70 brothers when he came to power. Or think of Athaliah, who slew all the seed royal. Well, at least you thought you'd uh, slay them all, because although unknown to her, God had spared little Jewish. But that was the general attitude towards power in those days. And that explains probably why Mephibosheth stayed well away from Jerusalem. He wanted to avoid the common fate of those in his situation, because if David had acted in accordance with the normal standards of those days, Mephibosheth would have been a dead man. Yet he asked this kind question about him. Is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul? Now, does this not remind us of God's kindness towards us in and through his king, Jesus Christ? We are God's enemies even more than Mephibosheth was an enemy of David. What's our state by nature? Colossians 1.21, you were once alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works. By nature, we hate God. We do want to know him. And the fact that we totally ignore him and even refuse his invitation is surely proof of that. But what does God do for his enemies? Something even greater than what David did for Mephibosheth. Romans 5.10 If when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. So David's kindness towards his enemy, or potential enemy, Mephibosheth, hence at God's even greater kindness towards his enemies. As we consider David's kind question, he asked this question about a member of Saul's house. But he also asked this question because of the covenant that he had made with Jonathan. David was motivated to act like this because of the covenant he had entered into with Mephibosheth's father many years earlier. And let me read to you what happened then. Here is David's covenant with Jonathan described in 1 Samuel 20. We read in verses 14 to 17, and you shall not only show 
me the kindness of the Lord while I still live that I may not die. But you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when the Lord has cut off every one of the enemies of David from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David saying, let the Lord require it at the hand of David's enemies. Now Jonathan again caused David to vow because he loved him. For he loved him as he loved his own soul. And again, verse 42 of the same chapter. Jonathan said to David, go in peace, since we have both sworn in the name of the Lord, saying, may the Lord be between you and me and between your descendants and my descendants forever. So he arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. David was motivated to act like this because of the covenant that he had made with Mephibosheth, his father, many years earlier. Now Calvin, in his sermons on this passage, actually chides David for his failure to remember his promise in the interim period. But whether he was to blame in that respect, I cannot say. I suppose there's just a possibility that he'd become so preoccupied with becoming king that he'd forgotten to keep his word. However, one thing is clear. He eventually did keep it. He made a covenant and he kept it. And that's our duty as Christians. If we make a promise, we should keep it as far as lies within us. As Psalm 15 reminds us, who shall abide in your tabernacle? Who shall dwell in your holy hill? He that swears to his own hurt and changes not. And there we're reminded that our communion with God is dependent upon our keeping our promises. And in verse 1, we're told that David kept his promise for Jonathan's sake. For Jonathan's sake. What a beautiful friendship that was. The, The relationship was so special that David vowed to remember his family in future days, even after Jonathan was removed from the scene of time. And does that not teach us the importance of showing kindness to the children of relatives or friends who have passed away, even though we may not know them personally? When I was a child, I had a very good friend called Jackie, and he died some years ago. I'd never met any of his children, but I met them at the funeral. And I tried to be as friendly as I could to them. Why? For Jackie's sake. Commentator Blakey applies this incident in a very interesting way. He asks, how would you treat a Jew? And then he suggests that it would be a good idea to greet them along the following lines. He said, you might say, I am thankful to God for your race, because to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law. And above all else, my Savior Jesus Christ proceeded from your loins. Now, he has a point, hasn't he? How much poorer we would be if we didn't have Abraham, Moses, and David, and above all else, our Lord, to learn from Jews by birth. And for the sake of these friends who were all Jews, he's saying we should be kind towards their descendants. And who knows, by acting like that, and even greeting like that, you may remove any prejudice that they have towards you. So David blessed Mephibosheth because of his covenant with Jonathan. But taking that to a higher level, does it not remind us that God blesses us because of his eternal covenant with Christ and ourselves. Friends, where does our salvation begin? Did it begin in time, the moment we put our faith in Christ? Of course not. To think like that is to seriously underestimate God's love toward us. You need think no further than the little phrase, the blood of the everlasting covenant. Everlasting. That's where our salvation proceeds from. Were you there when that covenant was made? Was I there? Of course not. We had no input whatsoever. Yet that's where it all began. That's all on the basis of covenant, isn't it? That's why one author has written a book with the lovely title, Love Before Time. That's our salvation. Love before time. Love with an everlasting love. G.S. Voss elaborates on that striking phrase with this comment. And Ted Donnelly made this statement some years ago at the Banner of Truth conference. I've never forgotten it. Commenting on that little phrase, loved with an everlasting love, Voss said this, the best proof that God will never cease to love us is the fact that he never began to love us. There you are. David's kind question. He asked this question about a member of Saul's house, an enemy. Secondly, he asked this question because of the covenant he made with Jonathan. And thirdly, he asked this question with divine love in mind as well as human love. Now, I've already hinted at this. But the way in which the author uses a famous Hebrew word in this passage substantiates what I'm saying. And this Hebrew word 
is a Hebrew word called kesed, and it's often translated God's goodness, loving kindness, mercy, and so forth. And it's used in verse 1. Is there anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? It's used in verse 3. Is, is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness of God? And it's again used in verse 7. Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for Jonathan's sake. So we're not only talking here about kindness on a human level, of David's kindness toward the house of Saul, we're also, also talking about the kindness of God, about divine kindness. And this word is used to describe the salvation that we enjoy. Psalm 63, verse 3, your loving kindness is better than life. Psalm 103, verse 4, who crowns you with loving kindness. So we dare not stop at a merely human level and contemplate the love of two human beings, one for another. We have to go higher. And God has shown us loving kindness, hasn't he? Towards his enemies by sending his son to enter the world to save us from our sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So we fall short in our understanding of this passage and we don't end up contemplating God's loving kindness in and through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is David's kind question. Yes, it's relevant on a horizontal level, but it's also relevant on a vertical level too. And then secondly, David's kind invitation. Verses 5 to 8. Then King David sent and brought him out of the house of Machir, the son of Amiel, from Lodabar. Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, had come to David, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. Then David said, Mephibosheth, and he answered, Here is your servant. So David said to him, Do not fear, for I will surely show you loving kindness for Jonathan your father's sake, and will restore to you all the land of Saul your grandfather, and you shall eat bread at my table continually. Then he bowed himself and said, What is your servant that you should look upon such a dead dog as I, David's kind invitation. Notice three things about it. Notice, first of all, where this invitation came from. It came from David, the king, the one whom Mephibosheth was subject to, the one who had suffered much at the hands of Mephibosheth, his family, the one who could easily have wiped Mephibosheth from the face of the earth. Yet David took the initiative here by asking about Saul's family in the first place. Then he interviewed Ziba to find out where Mephibosheth was, and lastly he sent for him to come to the palace. What a kind invitation this was. On a merely human level, we could say that David actively created a situation where he could exercise loving kindness towards this poor man. And it's good to follow in David's footsteps, isn't it? We shouldn't just show kindness towards those who ask for our help, although that's good. We should actively seek opportunities to do good wherever possible. Galatians 6.10 Therefore, as far as we have opportunity, do good to all men, but especially to the household of faith. That means that at this present time, if we know someone whom we can help in some way or other, we should use our initiative to help them wherever possible. But of course, we have to understand this passage on more than just a human level. Because we not only have a picture here of how David invited Mephibosheth, we also have a picture of how King Jesus extend, extends a far more glorious invitation to such Mephibosheths as us and offering us his so great salvation. And if David was active here towards Mephibosheth, and he was, how much more active is our God towards us? Isn't God a seeking God? David sought Mephibosheth out. Jesus Christ seeks sinners. As regards salvation, accomplished. God didn't leave, uh, remain aloof from us in heaven, did he? Rather, he became incarnate in the person of his son. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us. And as regards salvation applied, once again, God is a seeking God, isn't he? What does the good shepherd do? He sought us out, as the parable of the lost sheep reminds us. And it's worthwhile reminding ourselves why Gentiles such as us have come to faith. Ultimately, what is the reason 
for Gentiles such as us coming to faith. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. The good shepherd sought us out. Therefore, if we have come to know Christ, ultimately speaking, it's because he has sought us out. Now, his seeking doesn't negate our seeking, of course. We are duty-bound to seek the Lord while he may be found and to call upon him while he is near. But it's just that behind our seeking lies his seeking. And it was actually his seeking that gave rise to our seeking. So this is where David's invitation to Mephibosheth takes us. It leads us to think of Christ's invitation to us. Come unto me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Where this invitation came from? It came from David the king. There's a greater invitation from Jesus Christ to look to him for salvation. But don't only notice, let's not only notice where this invitation came from, let's notice who this invitation was extended to. It was extended to Mephibosheth. And let's be honest, he was a bit of a helpless individual, wasn't he? He belonged to the wrong family for starters. The family of Saul, who had persecuted David. He was also a cripple. And therefore was in no position to contribute anything to David's kingdom from this moment forth. We're also told he lived a long way off from the king's palace in a place called Lodabar, which means no pasture. And as evident from as is evident from David's soothing words to him, do not fear. It's obviously lived in constant fear. And yet this is the one to whom this invitation was given, Mephibosheth. Now, you don't need to be a genius to see where I'm going, do you? Because all these truths about Mephibosheth foreshadow what the Bible has to say about our native state. We're all Mephibosheths, aren't we, in a sense? We belong to the wrong family too, the family of Adam, and an Adam all day. And are we not crippled, spiritually speaking, because we have no desire to run in the way of God's commandments? In fact, we're without strength, aren't we? When we were without strength, Christ died for the godly. And we could also say we're afar off from our king, aren't we? Although through the gospel, those who are afar off are brought near by the blood of Christ. And as for pasture, does our good shepherd not take us from a barren place, spiritually speaking, and make us to lie down in green pastures and lead us beside the still waters? And if Mephibosheth had good reason to fear David. Have we not even more reason to fear King Jesus? Fear not him who can kill the body, but rather fear him who can put both body and soul in hell. But the invitation of the gospel goes to the Mephibosheth such as us. Where this invitation came from, it came from the king. Who it was extended to, it was extended to Mephibosheth. Notice how it was received. Initially, Mephibosheth was afraid because there was a lot at stake here. He didn't know how David was going to respond, did he? But the words do not fear brought comfort to his heart. And is that not what Christ says to those who look to him? Fear not, little flock, for I've given you the kingdom. We have every reason to fear him. He's king of kings, kiss the son, lest he be angry, Scripture says. But if we turn to him in repentance and faith, we will soon discover that we've received not the spirit of bondage again to fear, but the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. As we look to Christ, we have no reason to fear if we trust in him. We're also told that this poor helpless creature prostrated himself before David. Verse 6, he fell on his face and prostrated himself. He knew that his life was in David's hands, didn't he? And if we, friends, were to see the exalted Christ the way he presently is, we would respond in exactly the same way because our life is in his hands too. Remember how John witnessed him in Revelation 1 verse 7. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as one dead. But Mephibosheth went on to speak of himself as David's servant. He answered, here is your servant. Is not the right response to the Lord? Is not how Samuel responded? Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And Elijah too, I am your servant. I've done all these things according to your word. What I'm trying to say is this. The path Mephibosheth followed brought him into David's favor. And we need to have the same disposition towards the son of David. We need to fear him. We need to humble ourselves before him. 
and we need to look to him for mercy and to serve him. And if we do that, we'll discover that where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. David's kind question. David's kind invitation. And lastly, David's kind provision. And notice briefly three things here that David did for Mephibosheth. Firstly, he restored to him everything that his father Saul had lost. I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your grandfather. Some of you are probably thinking already of Isaac's what's words, aren't you? And him, the tribes of Adam, boast more blessings than their father lost. We inherit more in Christ than we ever lost in Adam. He was able to fall. We're not able to fall. He was placed in the Garden of Eden. We inherit a new heavens and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. So as regards David's kind provision, he restored to him everything that his father saw had lost. Secondly, we're told that he treated him like royalty. As for Mephibosheth, said the king, he shall eat at my table like one of the king's sons. From now on, this descendant of King Saul will be treated like one of David's sons. Does the gospel not bring about a similar change of status? We who by nature are of our father the devil can now say with John, Beloved, now are we the sons of God? This is what the gospel does for us. But then thirdly, in this provision we see that David not only restored everything that his father saw had lost and treated him like royalty, we're told that Mephibosheth enjoyed constant fellowship with the king. Verse 13, Mephibosheth dwelt in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. And once again, it's the Apostle John who guides our thoughts along the right lines, isn't it? 1 John 1 verse 3, Truly our fellowship was with the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. And just as David did all of these things for Jonathan's sake, our God blesses us for Christ's sake. It's interesting to compare one, verse 1 with Ephesians 4, 32. Verse 1, Is there still anyone who is left of the house of Saul that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? Ephesians 4, 32. Be ye kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. I want to close by quoting from Matthew Henry and, and Dale Ralph Davis because in many ways they summarize what this passage is all about and where it should lead our thoughts to. Matthew Henry says, David's kindness to Mephibosheth serves to illustrate the kindness and love of God our Savior towards fallen man, which yet he was under no obligation to show as David did to Jonathan. Man was convicted of rebellion against God and like Saul's house under a sentence of rejection from him, was not only brought low and impoverished, but lame and impotent made so by the fall. The Son of God inquires after this degenerate race, that inquired not after him. He comes to seek and save them. To those of them that humble themselves before him and commit themselves to him, he restores the forfeited inheritance. He entitles them to a better paradise than that which Adam lost and takes them into communion with himself, sets them with his children at his table and feasts them with the dainties of heaven. Lord, what is man that you should thus magnify him? And Ralph Dale Davis says, we are all the Lord's Mephibosheths, and there is absolutely no reason why we should be eating at the king's table. And yet that is our privilege in and through our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We're going to close by reading together Psalm 136. It's all about the mercy of the Lord, the loving kindness of the Lord, which endures forever. So if you'd read with me, please, from your book of praise, Psalm 136. O oh, thank the Lord, for he is good, his love endures forever. O oh, thank the God of gods always, his love will fail us never. Give glory to the Lord of lords, his love endures forever. Great wonders he alone performs, his love will fail us never. In wisdom he has made the heavens, his love endures forever. He set the earth above the seas, his love will fail us never. He made the sun to rule the day, his love endures forever. The moon and stars to rule the night, his love will fail us never. He struck down Egypt's firstborn sons, his, loves, his love endures forever. By might he brought out Israel, his love will fail us never. 
He made a pathway through the sea. His love endures forever. And through it he brought Israel. His love will fail us never. King Pharaoh and his mighty host, God's love endures forever. He swept into the raging sea. His love will fail us never. He led his people on their way. His love endures forever. He brought them through the wilderness. His love will fail us never. Thank him who struck down mighty kings. His love endures forever. And slaughtered kings of great renown. His love will fail us never. King Sion of the Amorites. God's love endures forever. And Og the king of Bashan too. God's love will fail us never. He made their lands a heritage. His love endures forever. For his own servant Israel. His love will fail us never. He thought upon us in our need. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love will fail us never. To every creature he gives food. His love endures forever. Give thanks to God. The God of heaven. His love will fail us never. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all, both now and forevermore.